Do you see grasshoppers? Some folks in the Old Testament did, and we'll study about that today on The Truth in Love. Here's the message true and glad for the sinful and the sad. Ring it out, ring it out, ring it out. It will give them courage new, it will help them to be true. Ring it out, ring it out, ring it out, ring it out. Ring out, barely ring the word. Speed it away, Lord, man. This is divine, and see. Send it today, still far Let from it. Jesus. Many live in sin. Let me take this opportunity to express my appreciation for you watching the program today. And I hope you have your Bible there and you'll have it open to Numbers chapter 13. We'll be studying today from chapter 13 and 14 as we uh, consider a very important event in the history of God's people. And while you're turning in your Bible to Numbers 13, let me ask how familiar you are with the following names. I don't have them memorized, so I'll have to read them, but they're important names. Do you recognize these people? Shamua, Shaphat, Egal, Palti, Gadiel, Gadai, Amiel, Sether, Nabi, and Giul. Well, are they familiar? Perhaps they should be because they were key characters in uh, a significant event in Israel's history. Those men had an influence uh, on God's people that, that had a profound impact on the course of that entire nation. Well, if we're not familiar with those names, perhaps we're familiar with a couple of men who were associated with them. Their names were Joshua and Caleb. See, we're talking about the 12 spies that went into the land of Canaan on kind of a, a recognizance mission to look at the land before God's people had, uh, before they would go in and take possession of it. And uh, we're going to be considering today the spies and specifically the ten as they are contrasted with Joshua and Caleb. Uh, we'll talk about the faithlessness of the ten versus the faith of Joshua and Caleb. One of the things just at the outset that we learn from uh, the events involving uh, Joshua and Caleb and the other spies is how that people can look at the same thing and yet not exactly see the same thing. The people, uh, the, the ten spies that had no trust in God uh, saw the same land that Joshua and Caleb did, but uh, Joshua and Caleb saw things a little bit differently because they saw God in the picture. Do you remember those um, posters and pictures that were popular a number of years ago? The computer-generated three-dimensional pictures where if you just simply look on the surface of the picture or the poster you don't really see anything except just a bunch of squiggly lines and colors but if you adjust your your eyes focus uh, to a particular in a particular way a three-dimensional image comes out and I've known people that have looked at those posters numerous times and they can never see the three-dimensional image within, uh, but others can. I was able to do that, uh, though it's difficult at times, but two people can look at the same thing and not see the same thing. Well, that's what happened here in the lives of these people, these ten spies, and in the lives of Joshua and Caleb. They looked at the same thing, they just saw things a little bit differently. Joshua and Caleb looked into the picture and they saw God. And these others did not. And so we're going to study this event in the lives of, of those people today uh, from Numbers chapters 13 and 14 and drawing in some other passages as well. And so as we begin the study, let's uh, consider the mission itself. Here is what they were uh, told to do, these spies. In Deuteronomy 1 verse 21, God told the people, 
Go up and take possession. Do not fear, nor be dismayed. So that was God's message to them. God had promised to give them the land, and He said, Go up and take it. Here it is. It's yours. Well, in contemplating that, uh, the people wanted spies to go in first, Deuteronomy 122. And uh, God allowed that and commanded Moses to comply. Uh, with that, Numbers chapter 13 is where we find that incident. So the people prepare themselves. The spies are chosen. Moses is wanting to gain some intelligence information. As a matter of fact, if you'll notice verses 18 and 19 of Numbers 13, uh, Moses uh, told them to see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds. And so that was their mission. They went in and uh, accomplished their mission. They spent 40 days in the land, mapping it out, looking at it, surveying it, getting a sense of what it was, uh, what it was like. And uh, 40 days after that, they returned back to the camp. And they give their report, which uh, starts out good. As a matter of fact, uh, in verse 27 of Numbers 13, uh, then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. They had brought back some of uh, uh, the fruit from the land to show how, what a bountiful land it was. So the, the, the report starts out great. Basically they say the land is everything God told us it would be. It, it, it does flow with milk and honey. A lot of provisions there. But, verse 28, there's a change. Nevertheless, they said, Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Those would be the, uh, the giants in the land. And so what started out as a favorable report uh, turns to one that's unfavorable. As they say, you know what, yeah, it's a great land, but well, the people are strong. And... Uh, they go on to say, I don't know if we, can, uh, if we can take it. But in the midst of that complaining, here comes this voice. Numbers 13, verse 30. The Bible says, Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome. Caleb knew that God had promised. And so he said, Let's, what's the, What are we waiting for? What's the delay? Caleb had been into the land just like the other spies had. He saw what it was like. He saw the same people, the same fortified cities, but he knew God had promised. And so he said, let's not wait around on this. Uh, let's go up at once and take it. But the pessimism persisted. Look beginning in verse 31 of Numbers 13. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, um, uh, came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Well, they saw grasshoppers. They looked in the mirror and saw grasshoppers. Were grasshoppers in their sight. And so uh, they had a pessimistic outlook. The ten spies did. Well, what was the result of that? The effect of it? Did the people listen to Caleb? Or did they listen to the others? Well, let's notice chapter 14 of Numbers. The first three verses. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? What a response. They didn't listen to Caleb who had faith. They listened to the ten who had no faith. 
And they wanted new leadership. They said to one another, verse 4, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Can you imagine that? After being delivered from the cruel bondage of Egypt, they get on the, the brink of taking the promised land and now they want to go back. Thinking that God had brought them to the land to simply be killed by the sword. Well, the Bible says Joshua and Caleb tore their clothes in protest and then made an impassioned plea. Numbers 14, beginning in verse 7. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then He will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. With milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. What a wonderful plea for sanity and reason and faith and trust in God that Joshua and Caleb made before the people. And thankfully the people listened. Uh, the, the plea of Joshua and Caleb had its desired effect. They, uh, uh, the people apologized for their lack of faith. And they, um, uh, you know, they determined that they were now going to go into the land and possess it as God wanted them to. They felt ashamed for their lack of faith. They thanked Joshua and Caleb for uh, changing their minds and expressed their profound gratitude for what Joshua and Caleb had done. Is that not what the Scripture says? It's not, is it? They didn't express gratitude to Joshua and Caleb. As a matter of fact, the Bible says they wanted to stone them. Can you imagine a people so distrusting of God that they would react that way. Well, that's the way they reacted. They wanted Joshua and Caleb to be killed. Well, the punishment is then given. Moses intercedes for the people according to Numbers 14, verses 11 and 12, but there would be serious consequences to their lack of trust in God. I want you to notice verses 22 and 23 of Numbers 14. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. Joshua and Caleb would be able to go into the land, but no one else of that generation, 20 years old and up, would be able to see and live in the land of promise. And it was because of their lack of trust in God. Notice how it's described further in the chapter of what would happen to these faithless ones. If you'll look, chapter 14, beginning in verse number 29, the carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you to dwell in. But your little ones, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. Now verse 33, And your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and bear the brunt of your infidelity, until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. And we read that the ten spies, specifically verses 36 through 38, died by plague. And those who listened to the faithless spies spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness as they died off in that, uh, in that time frame. And then the next generation would be allowed to inherit the land. What a compelling story. But in the time we have, we have remaining to us today, I want for us now to focus on practical lessons. What are the lessons that we can learn from this event in the history of Israel? 
Let me offer you these today. First of all, we learn from this that faith overcomes fear. Faith overcomes fear. Why were the ten afraid and the two unafraid? The difference was not in what their eyes specifically beheld. We talked about this point a little earlier. The ten spies saw the same land that uh, Joshua and Caleb did. They saw the same abundance of food. They saw the same cities. They saw the same strongholds. They saw the same giants. They saw the same thing. The difference was that Joshua and Caleb had faith in God, which overcame any fears and apprehensions that they may have had about the strength of the people in the land of Canaan. Faith overcomes fear. Our anxieties and our worries that we often have stem from a lack of faith, a lack of trust. As a matter of fact, you could argue that our uh, fears are a lack of faith and trust. Think about the times when Jesus addressed this issue among His disciples. For instance, in Matthew 8, verse 26, He said, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Notice the connection between their fear and their little faith. Again, in Matthew 6, verse 30, If God clothes the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will He not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Anxiety over the necessities of life, Jesus says, is a lack of faith. It's, it's, a, it's a sign of weak or little faith. Trusting in God. Believing God, believing what God has said is, is really knowing that God has spoken and maintaining the confidence that He will do what He has said He would do. That's what faith is. That's what it means to trust in God. It's to take God at His word and to believe that God will do exactly what He promised to do. Abraham was like that. Romans chapter 4, verses 18 through 21, we read how Abraham hoped against hope and did not waver or stagger at the promise of God. God had promised Abraham that he would bless him with a son in his old age and establish his lineage through that special son of promise. And though from a purely human perspective that seemed like an impossibility at Abraham's age and Sarah's age, nonetheless the Bible says he did not stagger at the promise of God. He did not stagger through unbelief, but he maintained his faith, his trust in God. He took God at His word and knew that God would follow through with what He had promised. I want you to think about the promise that was made to Israel in, back in this instance uh, regarding the land of promise. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 29 and 30, God is speaking and says, Then I said to you, Do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God, who goes before you, He will fight for you according to all that He did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Well, that's a pretty plain promise. Was there anything about that promise that was difficult to understand? I think not. God will fight for you. Don't be afraid of the inhabitants of the land. Well, then where was the problem? Did they forget? I doubt that. It simply was the case that they didn't believe that God would follow through with His promise. Matter of fact, that's what Hebrews 3 verse 19 says exactly happened. They could not enter in the promised land because of unbelief. They simply did not trust. They didn't allow their faith to overcome their fears. It's ironic that uh, the Canaanites had more faith in God than God's own people did. Because we would later read in Joshua chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, that Rahab would say, uh, Our people heard about what your God had done for you, and we were afraid. Our hearts melted within us, she would say. Well, the people in the land of Canaan were more afraid of, of the Israelites and had more of a fear of Israel's God than even Israel did. What a sad state of affairs. But the ten said, we are not able to go up against it. Uh, they are stronger than we. Numbers 13, verse 31. We were in our own sight as grasshoppers. Numbers 13, 33. But the two said, Joshua and Caleb, The Lord is with us. Fear them not. 
Numbers 14, verse 9. Jesus promised to His disciples, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Matthew 28, verse 20. God will never leave us nor forsake us. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. And so that ought to give us faith and confidence and hope and assurance that can overcome our fears and our anxieties. A second lesson that we learn from this event in the life of Israel is that discouragement is contagious. Discouragement is contagious. The ten were told in Numbers 13 verse 36, notice this, they made all the congregation to murmur. They made all the congregation to murmur. I want you to tie in that with a principle stated in Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 8. Deuteronomy 20 verse 8. This is um, uh, the part of the law of Moses that was governing uh, their battles, warfare, the, the, uh, the army. And here's what was stated there, Numbers or Deuteronomy 20 verse 8. The officers shall speak further to the people and say, what man is there who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house, lest the heart of his brethren faint like his heart. When the law was speaking concerning those that would be soldiers and do battle in God's army, the officers were to stand before that group of men and say, All right, who's ever, whoever is afraid and fearful, get out. Go home. Send him back to his house. Why? because that fear can be contagious, lest his heart that fainted cause other hearts to faint. They didn't need that in the army, because discouragement is contagious, and it was in this case. How different the story would have been had all of the people, uh, the twelve, all of the, of the spies, the ten with Joshua and Caleb and all the people, had they all possessed the kind of faith that they needed to and that uh, would have gone throughout all the people and uh, helped them to take the land without having to go through that wandering period. But discouragement got a hold of them, and it caused the rest of the group to be faithless as well. But here's a, a third and final lesson for today, and that is this. Lack of faith is rebellion. A lack of trust in God is equated with rebellion in this text. The failure of the people to trust God was considered by God to be exactly that, rebellion. As a matter of fact, Joshua and Caleb warned in Numbers 14 verse 9, Rebel not against the Lord. Rebel not. Well, what were they in the process of doing? simply showing a lack of trust in what God had said. But Joshua and Caleb equated that with actually rebelling against God. God asked in Numbers 14 verse 11, How long will this people despise me? Well, when you read about it, there it doesn't, it doesn't initially come across as something that one might call rebellion or despising God. He just had a little faith problem, a little trust problem. Well, in truth, there's really no such thing as, as, as a minor problem when it comes to, to weak faith. God says it's rebellion. God says those people were despising me. And God had every right to feel that way. God had promised them. What more did they need? If they truly believed in the God that they claimed to believe in, that would have been enough. God said it. That settles it whether I believe it or not. But I'd better believe it if I want to enjoy the blessings. And yet they did not. They rebelled against God. And when our faith does not move us to act in accordance with God's will, we are rebelling against God and forfeiting blessings that could be ours. Do we realize that? When we read in the Scripture that God says, Look, I'll take care of your necessities in life if you'll just put me first. Matthew 6, 25-34. And yet we continue to fret and worry and stew over things like that. What are we doing? We're rebelling against God. We're not trusting a God that is deserving of all of our trust. And we, we may very well forfeit blessings in the process. How tragic it is that they came so close 
yet they were not able to enter into that land simply because they quit trusting God and started, started trusting in their own fickle human perceptions. Well, there's a warning for us based on this event found in Hebrews 3 verse 12 where the writer there said, Take heed, beware, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. May it never be said of any of us that we have departed from God because we have failed to trust in Him. May God help us all to judge our circumstances, not by the size of the obstacle in front of us, but to judge those obstacles by the size of the God we serve. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, then we would like to give one to you. It won't cost you anything. We don't uh, sell our material. We don't ask our viewers to make donations to the program. Thankfully, uh, concerned members of Churches of Christ make these materials available and we're grateful to them for that because it allows us to give these things to our viewers for free. So if you will contact us at Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas, 76053, or email us at requests at thetruthinlove.com or go to our website, thetruthinlove.com, and you can uh, order materials there. Or if you'd like to leave a, a voicemail of your order, uh, you can call our toll-free number, 800-819-2966. And uh, you can have these materials in a variety of formats, written transcript, uh, audio CD, cassette tape, or DVD. And so if you'll just send us your address and the format in which you would like the program, we'll get that out to you as soon as we possibly can. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope to see you again next time.